Well, Dr. Reddy, thank you for finding the time to talk with me. Um, and congratulations on your new job. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for talking to me. Yeah. And uh, I guess, you know, I always start this and uh, simply because I can't find another way of, of, of really starting these conversations. Um, I, I quote, uh, I would quote Joe Simone, uh, mm -hmm. who said, when you've seen one cancer center, you've seen one cancer center. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so what mm -hmm. is Baylor? Baylor is one comprehensive cancer center, yes. <laughs> it is, uh, it well, how is it different from, say, Michigan? I see you have a, a, a coffee mug with the Michigan, uh, yeah. uh, uh, with a big <laughs> M. So, <laughs> yeah. Now, I think um, there's some things that are common, uh, and then there are some things that are fairly unique, and, and some things I'm still learning at Baylor. Um, and I, you want me to talk about what's unique to Baylor as, or distinct from Michigan? Is that? It's you know, really up to you. Yeah. I, the common things are obviously, I think, both are comprehensive cancer centers, both are very academically uh, driven places, uh, both are very deep in bench science. I think those are all the common factors. The the distinctions really, uh, I, I, I'm sure there's distinctions in the overall personalities of the place, which I will figure out with, with time. Uh, but I think there's some really structural differences. Uh, Michigan's uh, University Hospital, it's all one system, uh, top down. As complex as it is, it's relatively straightforward if you look at it outside in. Uh, Baylor is more complex organization. Uh, Michigan's a full university. Baylor is a college of medicine. So there is not that wider campus angle to it, be it from uh, engineering or be it from the economics department or, or the business school and things of that nature, which uh, but Baylor does compensate for that by having engagements with Rice University. Uh, on uh, uh, on basically some educational as well as some significant research interactions. Um, the other distinction is, as I mentioned, the university is one structure, including the hospital. Here, the hospitals are different entities, but they all come together on patient care and research, which is what ties them together, even though, uh, uh, and operationally, they're linked um, through the medical school and through the cancer center as it relates to cancer. Um, but then it, they're distinct entities otherwise. So you're having to deal with uh, different operations people in each each of the health systems that are linked to the Dan Duncan Cancer Center. So I think that's a little distinct and makes it a little more complicated. Um, and then, uh, like every place, I think uh, both Michigan and Baylor, they, um, they're all about trying to advance science and do the best for patients. So I think that's, uh, that's the underlying uh, factor for both of them. So I think, and the people are a little different. Texas is a little different from Midwest, uh, which uh, <laughs> which I, I which I'm sure I'll still figure out. But then there's also again the things, the common things that tie us all. I think everyone tries to do the best they can, strive for excellence. So I think those are the things that tie us all together and make us more similar than we realize. I think. Yeah, you've been in Michigan a long time. Uh, how many years? 23 years, if you include my years of training. Wow. Yeah. So you, uh, and you applied for this job because uh, why did you decide to move? Uh, yeah, I think the opportunity was exciting. Um, uh, you know, I think the thing I've found attractive and I find quite attractive about Baylor has been it's a place that does foundational science, which I always think should be the cornerstone for any major discoveries generally come from foundational science. And I think it hasn't given up its role in doing foundational science. And that was super attractive for me because I think real advances come from there. Uh, and it also, uh, one of the things that's unique to Baylor uh, and also found it um, more attractive is 
As you know, um, a lot of cancer centers now uh, are placing increasing emphasis that's being pushed by NCI on making sure disparities is uh, addressed and making sure communities engaged in, and also there's equitable uh, care and research as well. I, I think Baylor, it's intrinsic to it. Uh, I, I, that's been really, I have to say, quite attractive as well for me. Um, you, know, you, you don't have to bend backwards to see how you can make it happen. In so many ways, it's intrinsic to Baylor's existence and they've been doing it for decades. And that comes by virtue of where the hospital is um, present, which is uh, in the middle of uh, Harris County. Uh, and, and it just, by virtue of its existence, it uh, caters to the underserved and the uh, lots of the minority population. And there's, it presents an amazing opportunity to actually deliver equitable care um, just because of where where and how Baylor has been for decades. So that's been quite exciting for me. And then last but not the least, actually, I would say an amazing thing is the way the states come together to put this whole initiative of CPRIT, which uh, the CPRIT funding, which I, I think is just quite, quite forward-looking, extraordinary thing from the state of Texas, because that also allows for recruitment and the singular focus on cancer, where the state, the institution and individuals are all geared towards cancer. Uh, to me, that's uh, incredibly attractive. So I yeah. think those are, those are the high points of my attraction for the job. Um, and it's never an easy decision to leave any place, especially after you've been uh, baked into the system for so many years. <laughs> Yes. Uh, well, can we talk about the catchment area some more? Uh, what is the catchment area of Baylor versus, say, MD Anderson? Uh, you'll have to ask the people at MD Anderson right. exactly how they define their catchment area. But uh, Baylor's catchment area is really, as we'd like to call it, it's cancer care for all Houstonians. So it's the... Uh, Houston, Harris County, and its surrounding uh, seven counties, uh, really Houston metro area. That's, um, and it's, you know, the, the wider Houston metro area is close to 7 million people. Uh, so there's room for more than one comprehensive cancer center for sure. Uh, and so I, that is what we see as our catchment area um, for the cancer center. Um, so it's really Houston and its uh, surrounding areas. So Harris County and its surrounding counties. And it's very diverse and very and lots of disparities as well. Uh, can can we talk about that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm still figuring out all the angles to it. As you can imagine, it's been just a little over a month since I've joined. <laughs> but yes, it is a which is what I said is. It's part of Baylor's existence, the whole disparities uh, aspect of biomedical care, if you will, and certainly cancer care. Um, I don't want to say exactly how MD Anderson does uh, their community outreach and disparities research. They do a fantastic job, I'm sure. Um, our goal is really... Uh, uh, work on disparities within the within our catchment area, and there is about I would say close to thirty percent is uh, Hispanic population, mm -hmm. um, and and about ten is African American population, um, and then uh, the rest is Caucasian, and there's also about five percent Asian. So it's a it's a sizable percent is Asian, broadly categorized Asian population, uh, includes. Uh, uh, South Asian and as well as Southeast Asia, as well as uh, other uh, parts of Asia. So it's it's a very diverse community. Um, and there's also high degree of disparities uh, as uh, like any um, minority population, there's significantly um, poor, economically poor uh, disparity as well, uh, inner city, uh, more urban population uh, with the problems that come with crowding and the usual uh, other 
socioeconomic aspects of, related to it. Like Ben Taub is one of our primary uh, places of care for cancer care, uh, which is a county hospital, as you may know, and, um, and we do significant part of our clinical research efforts, including interventional therapeutic trials at Ben Taub. Uh, and I think we are unique in that way where we offer a lot of the cutting edge clinical trials, which otherwise usually, as you are aware, are not typically accessible to certain segments of the underserved population. And, um, and I think we do a good job and we can always do better. Um, but uh, I, I see that as one of our distinguishing features um, and in helping move the needle in a real tangible way towards uh, tackling disparities and access to cancer care and access to cancer research and clinical trials, cutting edge clinical trials. Um, I really see that as our distinguishing feature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do your own research interests feed into what you're going to, how will they direct what you're going to do as director here? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so my my own research uh, uh, spans pretty basic immunology to uh, translational clinical trials uh, in a relatively narrow space of cancer care. So I, I, I do bone marrow transplants and uh, unrelated donor transplants, and my research focuses around uh, the immunology of um, transplantation and cell therapy, um, and looking how to mitigate uh, the complications from bone marrow transplantation, particularly all the immunotoxicities like GVHD and, uh, and now with the CAR T cell uh, toxicities as well. Um, I think not particularly well known is why, um, why the minority population actually has, they don't have higher incidence of complications, but when they do get them, it tends to be a little more severe than the typical severity you would expect. Um, and uh, that angle remains unknown. And that's one area of research that our, our lab works on, looking at the immunological reaction that may be unique to a certain segment of population. Um, and the second part to it, really, the more clinically impactful aspect of it in the immediate future uh, is uh, the ability to find donors for minorities is very limited, unrelated donors for transplantation, um, as you may know. Um, and the National Marrow Donor Program and other large uh, national and international registries are heavily Caucasian, um, and there's very little minorities uh, enrolled in those. And part of my own research is to increase minority enrollment on those regist uh, registries so that uh, it's actually incredibly small percent of minor, uh, of the registries minorities. And it also includes uh, Asians. Um, South Asians and Southeast Asians. And, you know, so it's largely a, uh, so my own research in mitigating uh, complications has direct impact and trying to increase uh, enrollees into the registry is a direct, uh, a direct um, focus of our lab uh, and my clinical aspects of my work. Wow, so, that's fascinating. What, and this is important. Because for social justice reasons, or for, uh, or because of some clinical reasons as well, can can you talk about that? Uh, I think at the base of it, it's important for social justice uh, reasons, um, in, at its core. But it's also uh, important for medical reasons because. Um, in a broader reason, a broader uh, look, it, it is social justice. But for medical reasons, there are a significant portion of uh, African Americans and uh, Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans who actually don't get to transplant uh, uh, at the right time because they don't have access to donors. And oftentimes, by the time they get in there, they get poorly matched donor graphs, which we do use, but then the complications, as I was mentioning, were significantly higher then. And so they get them, they don't get them, and when they get them, it's late. And oftentimes, even when it's late, it's not perfectly matched. 
So that's like a triple whammy for poor outcomes. Um, so there is a, a, a sense of urgency around the medical need for finding appropriate number of donors for the registry. But like most things that we deal with, there is a social component to this. Um, I mean, minorities don't go and enroll for a variety of uh, complex uh, reasons. They don't necessarily go and enroll in these registries. And the, and the most important of which really is ignorance and lack of information. Uh, and I think information doesn't penetrate to the right places in the right way. Uh, and, and then everything trickles down from thereafter. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have access to right information, then you know, everything else is uh, impacted. How, how do you fix that? Uh, Gosh, I wish I had the magic wand, but one of the things that we are trying to do is try to go to where, uh, first of all, most people are not even aware what these therapies are and what they do and who they are for. Uh, and so our goal is to go through where we think uh, we could reach the maximum number of uh, minorities, including um, going through churches, which is where uh, uh, the significant portion of the Hispanic as well as the African American population uh, congregate uh, and work through pastors. That's one angle we are taking, and which I would like to enhance uh, in my role as well. And the other angle is we also we haven't done this yet, but I've had now a couple of conversations to try and do it through radio programs, which. Um, which I wasn't aware of, but uh, there are radio programs uh, that specifically cater to Hispanic Americans as well as to African Americans. A substantial portion of folks who listen to those radio stations uh, are demographically different. So we are trying to, our goal is to try and target some of those radio programs, both with uh, informational, educational, uh, uh, aspects as well as to um, then have uh, some of our own what we what I would like to call liaison folks embedded uh, from a community outreach and engagement groups uh, within these communities. We can't reach all of them. There's a manpower issue. There's uh, all kinds of other issues. So the in-person engagements are is a third a third leg to our approach, if you will. Uh, but that's going to be in select areas and we're in the process of looking at what areas would make most sense and we also have to find the right kind of people to engage those communities in person but that we will do as we go forward mm -hmm. so like kind of reading between the lines uh, uh i think I'm, I'm hearing you say this is one of the main reasons you're there uh mm -hmm. that's what brought you in your own research interests and and a way of overcoming a social pro problem is this correct am i am i taking liberties with what you've said uh no i think you're pretty accurate uh my own research is an important consideration but it is not what was not the driving uh consideration i think it's a collection of things that i've mentioned earlier drove me to it and my own research obviously helps me hurdle towards that goal even more and yeah no the social justice part is really important for me uh in many ways uh, and so it helps it puts me in the middle of things if you will um and and like i've mentioned i think baylor is just has a history of doing this and it is in the middle of things quite literally um so that that yes so i think you, you've kind of wrapped it together i think in a and accurate. then you kind of grow that your own interests enhance that with what a cancer center can do a comprehensive cancer center can do which is population research and outreach to to and then maybe solving the problem good god that would be pretty great yeah no i mean you know i it, it's one of those things right i mean it's a problem that we'll have to constantly be aware of and keep working at. And I, um, at some point, uh, and keep making a difference. And I generally like to see one person, one at a time and one life at a time. And every time you get impact one person, I think there's again, impact downstream further. But um, 
but yes, I, I don't want to make the tall claims if I'm going to be able to solve the problem. I would like to solve the problem. I'll tr strive to solve the problem. And, my, and I'm certain that we will make a dent on the problem and get to the promised goal of actually having worked on making disparities history, if you will, uh, for many aspects of care, and certainly in my own area of research. Asking this only as an immigrant, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, does it help to be from outside the United States? Does it help, does it give you a certain other way of looking at this problem? How does it affect your daily life? I think that that's a very deep question. We should do it over beer. Oh, <laughs> of course. That's <laughs> uh, too early for beer at this point. I know. <laughs> well, I'm Russian, so vodka would be better, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, but, you know, I think, again, I think that's actually quite insightful uh, question, I would say. I do believe it gives me a different perspective. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't say I deal with it every day. Uh, I think most days go by without, but there are many a time where I think being somewhat looking at it as an outsider who is somewhat naive about the situation as well as um, as well as there's always a sense when you're an outsider, you want to, you kind of feel a little uh, lost, if you will. I, I do, and I don't want to generalize this, but I do think it makes me uh, more, have more empathy from the social justice uh, angle onwards. Some of it is how I perceive the world, whether it's real or not. I mean, there's always a sense of how we perceive uh, being outsiders and how how we need to do, you know, how we have to kind of may not have the right angle to it or how we may have to approach it differently or how you're more attuned to or sensitive to another person feeling uncomfortable, if you know what I mean, and other person not having the right access because they don't speak the right way, they don't say the right things, they don't look the right way. So there's all kinds of angles to it. Um, so. Yes, it does. Um, I think it makes me a a, more, a person with greater empathy, uh, at least in my case. Uh, I think it helps me understand others better. Uh, mm -hmm. And 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 the, I, I really do. I think. I mean, like I said, it's a very complicated thing and a very yeah. deep one, actually. And um, yeah. Fundamental. It's fundamental, but it also probably affects the science and the way you ask questions. It kind of has to. It does. I mean, I, I, although, again, I think to me, a lot of science is curiosity driven, right? I mean, and you look at a problem and then, and then you're curious about the problem. So you look at the a question that's both biomedical and it's got a social angle to it. And then you get curious about how you're going to, why it is the way it is and what can you do? So I think curiosity uh, drives a lot of the persistence of staying with the problem. The problem and the question itself, you're right, it comes from your worldview. Uh, I haven't ever thought about it this way, but I'm just, maybe I'm rambling a little too much. Um, it's so uh, you've been in this job for a few weeks. What keeps you up at night? What 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 are some of the fears you have? I, gosh, this is like a catharsis for me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> hey, this is going to be boring. <laughs> <laughs> I, I certainly wasn't expecting the conversation to be this deep, and yeah. um, uh, but you know, no, this is great. Um, what keeps me up at night? Um, I mean, some of the things are general. I, I'm always, it's a little more personal, but uh, I'm always worried that I don't want to mess up anything and I want to do the right things. And I always 
question myself. Every decision I make, I question myself 50 times, but I also know there's the urgency of time and you have to make decisions. So what keeps me at night is going back over all the decisions of the day or the coming decisions for the next day and the constant worry that, you know, I do the right thing the right way all the time. I mean, I have to say that keeps me up. And then on a more, um, uh, I would say, um, on a more accessible level, um, I, you know, I, you know, Baylor has got its history and and it's got its reputation and 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 it's got so many wonderful things. I do want to emphasize certain areas even more, and and trying to figure out how to get all the resources and all of the people aligned in that direction it does take a fair amount of my neuronal energy if you will <laughs> and, and because the days are generally go one to one to one there isn't a whole lot of introspection during daytime honestly <laughs> so you know, most of it really comes in the night moments and and then uh, of course the science does keep me up I'm just I'm just very curious about some of the things and so I do read a fair amount of all my science reading late in the evenings and nighttime. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I wonder, um, I'm sorry to, to kind of jump around here, but uh, about disparities, I've just seen data suggesting that, uh, not surprisingly, that CAR T, for example, is not really available to, to people unless they have money. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your, uh, what are you, are you, dealing with this issue yet or what what are your thoughts no that's a great question again uh, um it, so one of the attractions for me as i've mentioned is the way the baylor is uh, situated and so even before i got to uh, baylor a few weeks ago there have been efforts to make it more accessible uh and the cell and gene therapy center at baylor which is uh you know, uh, with the Cancer Center and it's a Baylor uh, Institute as uh, and the Cancer Center, we've been working with Ben Tog to, uh, and as you know, working in County Hospital has its own restrictions and limitations and not the least of which is personnel and, 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 and really budget. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, We've been working in a systematic way towards getting fact accredited cellular therapy unit within Bentob. Right. And I would like to say that we've actually made some progress in you know, working with blood bank and making sure we have the right phoresis uh, at, um, at hand uh, and access to the right kind of nursing care and right kind of uh, uh, unit structure. Uh, so there is efforts and we've made progress we've actually submitted a grant for um uh to stand up to cancer to help with the disparities um research by setting up a unit so it doesn't really ask a research question but it promotes access to clinical care uh, for car t specifically uh for the underserved uh, and and the minority population and ben top is overwhelmingly underserved in minorities uh, and most of them are medicare or have no insurance as you may know um and so we've made progress and uh and i'm very very optimistic that over the next two years we will be able to offer uh car t cells to these patients in the right unit just the exact way everyone else gets it when they have good insurances and go to good private settings um and i would say we are quite i'm very optimistic that we'll be able to have this fully functional and operational within the next two years you know speaking of car t i was just at the aci and there were some beer fueled conversations about making car t less expensive uh by making it more generic is there uh is are you working on that uh is anybody working on that what are your thoughts whether it's even feasible i to be honest i haven't looked at how to make it generic uh but um i'll have to 
look into it. I haven't had a chance to look into it myself. Um, but it, it, uh, are people working on it and is it feasible? Uh, I think everything is feasible if everyone makes a genuine effort towards it. So, and I honestly, there's a lot of money in it uh, at the moment, as you know, from uh, a lot of, and rightfully so, it's been a huge advance and it takes a lot of resources to get the advances off the ground. And, but also once the advances have been made, we want to make it more equitable and accessible. So, um, but um is it possible? I think so. Uh, you know, it's never going to be perfect, but I think we will make some inroads. I mean, uh, like for example, at Baylor, uh, we have some of our own um, CAR T products, uh, which are FDA under FDA. They're mostly on the research side of things and not commercially given out. Um, and our hope is like when we open at Bentob, they would have access to these research products, which otherwise oh. would never have been possible. Uh, and these have to be done on federal grants and grant support and institutional dollars and other ways. And there's not going to be a huge um, uh, private investment into this from the farmers. Uh, but we also think a lot of the pharma, I think with the right enticement and the right environment would be willing to give uh, some of the access to their products. Um, and that needs to be negotiated one off with every pharma company and the context would vary. But I think the, your general question, is it possible? Will it become generic at some point and, and uh, will it be accessible? My own view is waiting for it to become generic before we try and make it accessible. Maybe we lose uh, many more patients along the way mm -hmm. before we get to that promised land. Uh, so I think while that will always happen at some point down the road and sooner than later, perhaps even uh, with sustained efforts, but I do think it's still always a little too late. So we have to keep making other efforts. Um, Mm -hmm. At least one way, and there could be other solutions to it, but one way we are approaching it at, at our county hospital. I'm actually super excited about that. Um, that sounds, I'm glad I asked because uh, the numbers are you know half a million versus like 30 some thousand. I mean, mm -hmm. those are the numbers that were kind of I jotted down on, yeah. the, on the cocktail napkin. Um, but the other, the other question, if I, if I had a cancer center, I would be probably really worried about, uh, would be the, uh, multi-cancer detection, uh, tests. Are you, um, are you worried about those? Uh, because look at how much, uh, trouble we can get ourselves into with very, very specific, well, very limited, uh, use biomarkers. Uh, I can't even imagine what multi-cancer things could do in in my. Are you thinking about that? A little bit. Uh, I'm at the moment. I'm not overly worried about it <laughs> uh, because of the other things that are occupying my head right now. But um, <laughs> uh, but but yeah. I mean, I could see it snowballing into something that. Uh, will be near impossible to handle. But a lot of these things, by the time they actually play out, I think uh, the other systems will come up in place. And I'm, I'm more optimistic, actually, in, in general about a lot of things. So I think, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, like I said, I'm, it's not keeping me up at night right now. <laughs> but uh, but it, I, I could see that as a, a potential issue down the road. Uh, but I don't think we're quite on that precipice at this moment, uh, at least in my read of things. Yeah, I, I'm not saying I'm not I'm not even being pessimistic. I'm just being neurotic. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, so can't be helped. Um, is, yeah. is there anything we've missed? Anything uh, I forgot to ask? No, this has been very <laughs> distinct conversation. Then <laughs> I was thinking you're going to ask us about our programs and uh, that oh. kind of stuff, but but this has been actually. I, did a, ask. <laughs> I think I did. If there's any yeah, program yeah. I forgot to ask about, please tell me. 
Oh, no, no, it's not. You know, those are more uh, usual questions, and I don't think it gives deeper insight other than the usual uh, platitude kind of statements and some generic stuff. I mean, th that's what those usually end up being. But, um, but no, this is very, I would say, deep conversation for early morning <laughs> <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Well, thank you. Nice meeting you in person, um, or on Zoom, rather. Um, and uh, let's just keep talking.